Hello Tubers, this is Kurt with Edibles and Exotics coming to you from Sunny Mesa, Arizona. Today we're going to go on a field trip to George's house. He's over in Gold Canyon, Arizona, which is not too far from here. And he just recently purchased a house within the past year and uh, he's interested in doing a permaculture style food forest. So we're going to go over there and uh, we're going to discuss uh, his wants and needs and try to take it from there. and hopefully get his uh, plan rolling. So let's head out. Hey guys, so I'm standing here with George. He uh, gave me a call, wanted me to come out and do a little consultation on his yard, help him plan it out. He's into the permaculture and growing his own food. Anyway, so like, what's your what's your plan for your yard? You, you want to do uh, permaculture kind of stuff, or so? Yeah, years ago when I first started looking at all this, I wanted to grow. I was big into juicing, and I wanted to grow my own food and have the healthiest food possible. But, you know, as the years went on, I came as studying, I lived in apartments and rented rooms and I couldn't garden. So I figured I might as well just study and study and study for when I finally have my own place. So permaculture came up and I was, yeah, this makes complete sense. And then as the years gone, have gone on, I, I realized that we, we all need to become producers with the way everything is going in this country right now. Oh, so yeah, for sure. I do want to be able to pull the vast majority of the calories that I eat from my backyard. Yeah. Yeah. You know, also with uh, with growing in your backyard, um, you get all the beneficial bacteria. You eat it, you know. Oh yeah, raw food. So inside the fruit, outside the fruit, the leaves, the flowers, whatever you're eating. They say even the beneficial bacteria, even with you putting your hands in the soil it on your skin. and getting it on your skin, yeah. can actually help with oh, depression. Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. And uh, you know, uh, a lot of the, the fruits and vegetables you eat, you can't absorb those vitamins and minerals without the probiotics or, or beneficial yeah. bacteria in your stomach to digest it and break it down into you know basically how you can get it into your bloodstream mm -hmm. and uh you know also with uh eating vegetables and fruits and stuff like that you get the uh, prebiotics which right. is what feeds the gut bacteria so that's one thing you can't really get you, know, sort of, you, know, you buy some of fruit it's all sterilized and, and you don't know what chemicals have been sprayed exactly on it you know you can eat ground up and you know it, it's going to do a number on your gut bacteria so and the more i studied that the more i realized the most of the fruit what's weird is you walk into some of these stores and you see this big sign that says arizona grown yeah but if you really start looking at a lot of the fruit and vegetable in there it's like product of mexico product of yeah. you know, those kind of 
countries don't have the same standards, EPA standards that we have yeah. for spraying. So you don't know really what's sprayed on those oh, yeah. crops. Of yeah, and you know, uh, most of the produce that comes into this country from other countries, they run it through a machine that actually irradiates the food yeah. to sterilize any sort of pathogens or anything good in there. So yeah. when you when you get it off the shelf, it's 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 dead food. Yeah, covered in chemicals. You think you're doing something good for yourself, but yeah, yeah, it's yeah you just never know. Just like eating almost anything else. Yeah, yeah, and uh, a lot of them are uh, Monsanto seed. Yeah, so I'm sure you heard about that. Into doing it. Yeah, it's all uh, you know, GMO or, or bred a certain way, and, and the nutritional value is not there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, they get a monopoly, and it's, yeah. that's not good for the people. Oh, I paid in all uh, those countries or poor countries to begin with. One eighty six yeah, so. for my house. All right, so we're standing in uh, front of George's side yard here, and he's got a couple of raised beds, and just wanted to ask him exactly how he prepared the beds. So go ahead, and take it, George. All right. So when I first moved in, didn't have the beds. And I knew I wanted to get fertility into the soil. And so I ordered, uh, or I did a request for a chip drop, which is a company that will contact arborists near you and let them know that you have a request out there. And those arborists bring out a full load of wood chips. So I started this whole yard just by the layer of wood chips. And then as I built the beds out and got them in place, when it came time to filling them, part of that chip drop were, there were logs in there. Well, a lot of these beds have those logs in the bottom of them. And if any of you out there watching have ever studied hugel culture, that's kind of where I came up with the concept where those logs over time will kind of, they'll start to decay, start to rot. And in that process, they, they store water and they'll actually give that water out to the garden in the future. So logs on the bottom, then I put wood chips in to fill the empty spaces. Then on top of that, I did a layer of um, horse manure to get some bacterial life in there. So on top of that is rock dust and then some of the uh, Dr. Earth's products that are they're organic but they have the bacterial life in there so i wanted to get the bed started with all the proper bacterial life then on top of that i did a layer of sand mixed with peat moss and perlite and that's what we see right now and in the future i will top those off with compost and then mulch that with more wood chips so uh, I see you got some irrigation going in there. So this is on drip yes. or is it flood? It's just drip. This is drip. Okay. This is a product called Netafim. Um, the reason I went with it, I, I watch a lot of YouTube videos and there were several YouTubers in the Tucson area that were all running this and they all recommended it. Um, I, it's made in Israel. So it's made in a country that is a desert and they just develop products for the desert so i'm hoping they'll hold up even with our hard water i have heard people say that they'll end up getting clogged up and like the tips of the emitters yeah. yeah and if that happens i'll i'll figure something else out yeah but that'll probably be at least two years later. Yeah. if it happens so what do you have growing in these beds right now? What are these guys right here? These guys are fava beans. Fava beans, that's so cool. I knew these guys like the cooler weather and I planted them probably in October. And the reason I did it, I mean, I obviously want to eat some fava beans, but they're a nitrogen fixer. So I wanted to kind of start to get the nitrogen process into the soil. Um, that's these right here are chickpeas and down there are some sugar ant peas and all of them are nitrogen fixers so with the nitrogen fixers that is the bacteria that grows around the roots that actually allows the nitrogen to be put back into the soil and, and being in the desert here our native soil is pretty much just decomposed rock yeah. off the mountain that you probably saw in the beginning of the, the video there so it's, it's pretty devoid of any sort of uh, 
organic matter for the most part. So those uh, any sort of beans are really going to help the soil out. Now you do have to <laughs> inoculate your beans with the nitrobacter. So I did have to order some of that. You put the, the nitrobacter in a bowl of water and you put the beans in there and mix them around so it gets on the surface. Then once they start growing, that bacteria is on the, the seed and it just goes right into the root system and hopefully inoculates all your soil with that bacteria as well. So these beds, are you going to cover these with more uh, arbor, arborist chips or? That's my plan. That's your plan. So you're going to be getting another chip drop here. Oh yeah. Pretty soon. I have know. a request in. That's great. How many, how many have you gotten so far? Three. Three. Wow. Yeah. And how thick is the, uh, how thick are these wood chips that we're standing on right now? About six inches or? I, probably in the beginning. Yeah. They, they uh, I down. mean. It was, I was surprised at how fast these chips like dropped down in size in the first two months. Yeah. August and September when yeah. you still had the heat. Yeah. And when I, when I would scoop down to the bottom just to check on them, like there was one day in August or in October, I scooped down to the bottom and I just reached up and there was just a handful of brown. Yeah. It was just brown and fluffy, and it's like, oh, yeah. the process has begun. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Arborist so, chips are great. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're full of mycorrhiza, too. So yes. a lot of people don't know that, but the uh, the chips, they, they get mycorrhizal spores that drop out of the sky um, when they're still trees, and when they grind them up and you, you put them on the ground, those spores wind up growing and, and attaching to the plant root system, and uh, your symbiotic relationship begins between the plant and the, uh, the soil. So, yeah, that's another plus to them. Um, and geeky me, like... Like a week and a half after I got the wood chips here, I, I looked outside my window. I'd look at them every day, and there were mushrooms that were popping up. Oh yeah, there was some form of ink cap mushroom. I I studied them, and they were one of the first ones to show up. Yeah, and, but it just excited me. Like I got mushrooms already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In my yard, I get uh, they call it dog puke. Yeah. fungus. I don't know if you've had that yet, no. but it, it literally looks like the dog ate some kibble and barfed it up on top of okay. the wood chips. But looking forward to that. Yeah, excellent decomposer. <laughs> Did purchase some. Uh, it's called King's Drafarian. Mine cap mushroom. Yeah, and I put some of that mycelium in here. Really? Yeah. Oh wow. So that's a uh, wood chip wood decomposer. It's a weed, wood decomposer, but okay. it's an edible as okay. well. Oh wow. So I can't wait to go start to grow. Yeah, but yeah. I know they're growing because anytime I do work in here and I, I rake back, mm -hmm. there is a white mat yeah. underneath it. Yeah. So once I see that, I, I kind of just put everything back and try to be real gentle as possible. But Wow. So are, are these wood chips retaining moisture? I know we've had a lot of rain in the past month or so. If you dig up right now, is is it pretty moist underneath, or yeah. is it it's still pretty moist? Yeah. So and then if you look at the rest of the yard, the yard is concrete hard where it's not covered in wood chips. Yeah. So yeah, huge difference. Huh? Well, I've had to do the the part of the yard that you've seen so far. I've had to move those wood chips, but I had them sitting in almost half of the yard yeah for months and then probably november i had to rake them up and move them somewhere else and when i did that you could see a line there was a color difference where the side that didn't have the chips was just completely tan whereas the side that had the chips was like a chocolate brown really and it was just holding in all that wow. water yeah that's pretty amazing. Was it, was it softer? Did you try digging down and do a little yeah. comparison? Oh, yeah. And it was softer? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, the, the tan stuff was like concrete, like you said. Yeah. And then that stuff, you could take a shovel to it, hit it with your foot, and it would go right in. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and that's only a couple of months of yeah of uh, the wood chips actually being on the ground. So I can't wait to see what a couple of years is like. Yeah. yeah. So you plan on doing uh, repeated chip crops over the next couple oh, of years to, oh, yeah. to really build up the soil. Oh yeah. I mean, I got to get filled in what I need to get filled in right now. But with the way these decompose, I know that they're just going to keep coming. Yeah. Yeah. And your your HO, you're in an HOA, and they, they yes. don't mind that having a, a big chip drop in the driveway for a couple days until you can shovel it into the backyard. Well, I'm 
the, the neighbors <laughs> didn't complain. Well, that's a good thing. And yeah. I, I, I busted butt, and yeah, like I, I got rid of it, one of the chip drops in like two days. Yeah, that's about how long it takes me to. The nice thing is, is like I've been wheelbarrowing rock and sand as well, and chip drops are nothing compared to rock or sand. Yeah, so. yeah, a couple of shovelfuls yeah. of sand, and it's like, oh, and then yeah. the chips. Yeah, you can do a whole wheelbarrow, and it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Look at that, a pea right from the, the garden here, growing in Arizona. And it's delicious. Full of water, right? Oh yeah. yeah. Water, crispy, sweet, excellent. Yeah. Nothing beats straight out of the garden. Definitely not. So what else do you plan on growing in this garden? So that's some, one of the beds down at the end will be asparagus. Next to that one's gonna be sweet potato. One that we saw that already had the, the lines dug in it. I've got some potatoes planted in there. Have you um, grown potatoes here before? I have not. They are very hard. <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay. They get uh, they get a little beat up. You're probably gonna have to shade them. A lot. Okay. Um, yeah, they get a little beat up just from the heat. Right. Not even the sun, just the heat. Really, they they, uh, they transpire so fast. They they really run out of water pretty quick. How about the sweet potatoes? Sweet potatoes grow here like weeds. Okay. Yeah. Those, I mean, I may swap the beds then. Yeah. At, at a future date. But yeah, once the, as the asparagus grow up, then I, I've seen those ferns get like this tall. So yeah. they might shade out the potatoes. They see a lot of asparagus starts, like yeah. the little roots. The crowns. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, they usually take uh, about two, three years before yeah. you can start really years. harvesting them. But uh, they're a long lived plant. You can leave them in, they'll, they'll grow for 30 years. That's what You'll I'm be eating them when you're when you're an old man, <laughs> right out of the yard. Already an old man. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what else uh, we got? How many beds do we have here? Anyway? We got one, two, 15. three, four. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's great. So and um, this bed here, I have some okra seeds already planted. Mm -hmm. um, but there's going to be a mixture of uh, okra, peppers. Eggplant, tomatoes. Uh, we get down further into these beds. I've got some uh, some watermelons planted in here. Uh, this bed has some winter squash, uh, spaghetti squash, mm -hmm. uh, Waltham butternut, and then this bed I don't have anything in yet, and uh, don't really know what's going to go into that one yet. You know, uh, you were mentioning the squash, so I had a little issue last year where I wound up getting aphids. Yeah. And uh, had them on zucchinis, pumpkins, all sorts of stuff. And what I realized is nitrogen. If you give them too much nitrogen, you wind up with aphids. <laughs> so if you're growing those, be very sparing if you give them any sort of nitrogen fertilizer okay. at all. Um, they, they do fine on their own without the nitrogen. Pretty much, okay. yeah. They will grow like weeds, especially how you have them prepared. You know, yeah. if, you, if you chip them on the top, they'll they'll be really okay. self self growing. You won't have to give them anything, but yeah, just It'll stay do. away from the nitrogen with with squashes, any sort of squashes. But what about these uh, these ones on the end here with the trellises? These ones. So these ones, um, I did put some seeds in for uh, cucumbers. So I had a, a market more 76 cucumber on one side and I planted a lemon cucumber on the other. This side has an Armenian cucumber. And then this side is gonna be some beans. Are those uh, grapes that I see over there? Or? Those are just, um, when I did some pruning on the passion fruit. Yeah. I just wanted to see if they would root and I just stuck them in there. They haven't died, but <laughs> I haven't checked to see if roots have formed. Yeah. So it's just an experiment. You'll know in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> That's yeah. for sure. <laughs> once it starts warming up. Yeah. I hear these things are going to go crazy once the, the passion fruit warms up. Yeah, they do. Um, they're pretty good in the sun. Um, in the heat of the summer, they will get burned back a little yeah. bit. But um, yeah, I think uh, with passion fruits, once they're really established, I think they're they're good at that point. It's yeah, it's well, just the juvenile phase where you gotta just like any other tropical, you gotta kind of care for them. And then the problem here is they only last. What I hear is that they only last about three years here. Yeah, because our summers 
uh, fry them with the heat, but then the winters kind of get too cold and they get fried from the frost. Yeah, so. well, you, you are in an open area there. Yeah. Um, they get frost protect them. Yeah. Well, see, that brings you back to the permaculture. Uh, basically, uh, you know, you gotta you gotta have a cap frost protection. So, what do you uh, what do you plan on putting back there? That's why you're here today. All right. Well, let's walk over there. All right. So, uh, <laughs> what exactly do you want to get planted back here? Do you want uh, you, you want to do a food forest kind of? Somewhat similar to a food forest. So, I mean, my backyard's rough right now. You see this berm that I've created. Yeah, what's that about? Basically, it's these properties are graded. So they're graded so that from the middle of the property, when you get a rain event, the, the water will flow to the side of the property. And then they're graded so that the water flows from the sides down the side yards and out to the street. Okay. But what I'm trying to do with this, since we do have a fair amount of clay in our soil, I put this berm of dirt here. Then I went and I went down about 10 feet of the dirt at a time. And then I went around and packed it. Yep. And now it, it's pretty hard. Pretty hard stuff. So I actually was watering the, the passion fruit the other week and I you know, went a little bit too much and the water flowed out and it hit the berm and it just started pooling up. Really? Which is exactly what I want. I yeah. want to hold as much water on this side and trap it so that the, the ground absorbs it, but also the wood chips absorb it. Yeah. And then anything that, that overflows onto the sides can go down the side of the house. So you're fl slowing the flow and letting it sink down. And yes. That's excellent. I want to keep as much water on site as I can for those roots of the trees to yeah. drink up. But yes, this area will eventually be filled in with wood, wood chips, which is a chip drop. And then I want trees throughout this area. And one of the reasons I called you out today was to help me with tree placement. Um, you know, do I put a, an evergreen here and a deciduous here? Or you know, how do these trees play off of each other during what times of the year? And, You've got the experience. <laughs> I've got the book smarts. You've got the street smarts. When we're talking about like permaculture, um, basically you're going to want to have a canopy. So you start with the canopy, then you're going to get your understory trees, uh, which would be like avocados and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Eventually they will grow into a canopy tree. Uh, then you're going to need bushes uh, or shrubs. Um, the next one is going to be vines. So if you wanted to do like grape vines or your passion fruits, stuff like that. Um, then the next one's going to be ground cover, which just covers the ground. And then underneath that, you're going to have your, your root type plants like sweet potatoes sweet potato. and stuff like that, okay. which are also vines. Yeah. So basically uh, you're, you're out in the open here, you know, there's, yeah. there's nothing around and being out in the desert, it's going to get a little cold here in the winter. And uh, being out of town, you're not going to get as hot, but you are going to have dry wind. So mm -hmm. um, basically, you're going to have to plan out uh, a canopy. I would start with the canopy first uh, to help with sun protection, frost protection, and then uh, you know the understories and stuff like that are going to be your wind protection in the summer. But what's reckon what I recommend here is uh, like a high density. So it's very dry here in the summer. We can get down to three percent humidity. And 118 degrees with blasting sun. So, um, yeah, people, people don't realize when they hear 118 degrees, that's ambient air temperature. Yeah, that's not the sun. I have a laser thermometer, and if you hit the soil surface with that, it could be anywhere from 150 to 200 degrees. Yeah. 
but you get the wood chips, so yeah. the surface of the chips, they might get that hot. Yeah, but if you dig down into there and hit it. Yeah, it's going to be 80, 80 degrees. Yeah, yeah, which is perfect. That's what the plant roots want. That's what all the mycorrhiza and bacteria and soil life like. So I think uh, step one is, is going to be uh, obviously plant selection, what you want to grow. Um, and you're going to have to take off every category. So you're going to need some sort of canopy, an understory, uh, bushes or shrubs, ground cover. Uh, the ground cover is not going to be as important because you got the wood chips. But you really do need to create some sort of uh, sunblock, some sort of frost protection, and a windbreak. I think those okay. are your, going to be your main keys here. Um, uh, unfortunately, you know, since we don't get that much rain, you're going to have to add water as needed. Sure. Um, it's already I, in place. Yeah, I, I don't really recommend out here drip irrigation. That's okay for like really established stuff. But uh, how about this? I, I mean, I already see this line right here. I already have that installed, but along the back here where you see these flags, I have one of those main lines as well. Yeah, and then I have these heads that are some people call them bubblers, some people call them a spray head. Yeah. yeah, that's what I use in my yard. Okay. okay. Yeah, so no, I would never for a tree drip. Yeah, that, that's a really big misconception around here, you know. Especially if you're growing tropicals, you know, when, when you go to the rainforest, it, you don't get one drip in one spot for hours on end. No. Right? It floods the whole area. So, yeah, you know, uh, the rest of the plant's going to really mirror what's above ground. So what's above ground is what's mainly going to look like below ground. So, you know, you, like your passion fruit, for instance, I mean, that's like two and a half feet tall, maybe two feet wide or so. So your root ball is probably going to be somewhere around two feet wide and maybe a foot deep, something like that. So, yeah, you want to really water that whole area. So, yeah, I would definitely recommend some sort of micro sprayer or a bubbler or something like that, you know, around each one. Um, now, I've seen some people have told me it doesn't matter. Some people say you want to put one on either side of your drip line so that the whole root system gets watered evenly. Yeah. Do you recommend? That? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, with the wood chips around there, I try to uh, keep the water a little bit away from the trunk just in case, you know, you don't want to be like that but um, yeah as far as watering go goes I, I definitely recommend you know flooding it like that um, you know basically uh, in the summer obviously you need more water in the winter yeah, but, definitely. Uh, right. so how would you suggest watering during the summer is it I've seen some some sources say you know a little bit a few times a day maybe like 10 20 minutes a few times a day or all at once and let it go for a whole week well, so you got the wood chips um, the ground can only absorb so much water at a time um, you can you can do either or whatever your schedule really permits you know I mean I'll be, you work from home so it shouldn't really right. be an issue and if you automate it it's not that big a deal at that oh, I did automate it. Yeah. when I was doing all this so I the whole system out my hand yeah but it goes from the the raised beds all the way around the house to the other side and i said if i'm putting all this time and money into it and this is really what i want to do i went ahead and got one of those smart timers yeah so i can control everything come in nice and handy excellent yeah so yeah i would i would definitely recommend some more floods in it you know i mean you don't have to go crazy with it but you know you're probably gonna be dragging those around in the summer too because you know you get the, the sprayers going you know some plants are gonna need a little different bit more trees. than others yeah yeah yeah, yeah like your loquat for instance you know you you want to plant the loquat they require pretty moist soil in the summer it's the winter it's not that big of a deal but the summer yeah they, they want to be pretty moist and uh you know you, you are up on a little bit of a hill here so even though you're trapping a lot of the water with your berm and and you get the wood chips and everything it's it's, it's still it's still, yeah it's still gonna want to really gonna out. seep in yeah you're, you're gonna have a spring running out the, the the drainage area behind the house here so what kind of uh you know i, I said you know you really need to start with the uh 
understory and the canopy trees. I mean, what more did you have in mind for that? Did you want to do all fruiting plants and trees? Pretty much. Pretty much. So, yeah. you know, uh, obviously you can't grow mulberries here, and they're, they're great canopy trees. Um, what did you What did you have in mind as far as something that's going to get tall quick and produce some shade, fruit, food, whatever? Um, I know star fruit is supposed to be a really good one. I don't know if it's a canopy tree. It's not a canopy. It's not tree, a canopy tree. Okay. Okay. No, I hear they grow uh, fast, and they do. Yeah, they're they're more of a bushy understory okay. kind of plant. Um, um, I know mango is on my list. Um, a mango is a canopy tree, but it's going to take probably 15 years to be that canopy tree. Okay. So, you know, in permaculture, what about figs? The figs do vote, grow very quick, but they are more of a, a bushy kind of understory tree. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> permaculture principles. Um, what a lot of people do is they will grow like uh, a fa very fast growing trees that are sacrificial trees. So you're going to grow them, and they're going to get pretty big pretty quick, and then that's going to shade your plants underneath and protect them from frost and stuff like that. And then understory trees turn into your canopy trees you just cut down those chopping. sacrificial trees and it's it's chop and drop so you just drop them on the ground like caster yeah yeah any sort of like a uh, like humus type tree is you know nitrogen fixer uh, is really good um but yeah you, you drop chop and drop them and that's going to feed the soil and then you leave the trunk in the ground and all those roots are going to decay and, and create air space and food for the the soil microbiome so okay. you know uh there's a lot of like moringa's a very fast growing tree i was tree. just gonna ask about um, moringa yeah very it's, it's I know, an edible just... tree yep you could eat the leaves you could eat the flowers you could eat the seed pods when they're young you can cook them when they're older um very nutritious they grow them in uh, a lot of third world countries for uh nutritional supplementation to help people that are starving because they, they grow so quick and easy. Um, so if you planted a bunch of Moringa trees back here, um, you know, you could have, uh, it, probably in about a year, year and a half, you could have some pretty good shade and it's dappled light too. So it's not full shade. So a lot of your, your tropicals are still going to get that sun they need, but it's going to be like a living shade cloth. Okay. So I don't know if you're giving any thought to that. No, I haven't. No? no? No, okay. So, yeah, that's, that's one tree that I would definitely recommend. Uh, you know, mulberries would be a great thing, but then again, <laughs> you can't grow those. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of a catch-22 here with your HOA. So, he's, uh, he's not allowed to grow mulberries or olives yeah. in this community. So, um, if it's a mulberry, uh, you know, even if the HOA says you can't grow those, you can still grow them in containers. Yeah. So, you know... Uh, HOAs, they can only dictate what's in the ground. They can't mm -hmm. dictate what's, what's in a pot. Above the ground, yeah. So, you know. Um, you there will actually, be a mulberry on this property. <laughs> <laughs> you could uh, you could actually, you could probably plant it in a pot and let it grow into the ground. True. <laughs> you know, it's still in a pot, even though it's rooted yeah. in the ground. They might not be able to say anything about that. But, uh, yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to get a list of uh, some sort of canopy trees here that you can grow okay um figs will be great for uh you know an understory i know you want to grow uh, avocados you're planning on doing one of those um but uh with avocados so they uh they don't grow bark because right. they they grow in the rainforest they're an understory they're tree, under, so, yeah you know they're they're their branches are green so they can photosynthesize because they don't really get much light in their, their native habitat so it it takes about uh five years or so for them to really get barked but i have a trick for uh growing those with sweet potatoes i was talking to you about that before yeah. to use a, a living cover over them and an indicator plant but you could also do um natural uh sunblock for plants right. so for tropicals have you ever heard about that not the natural i mean okay, i know so, you were doing some videos and you said you were gonna you were gonna make a video on some yeah i'm gonna do that pretty soon sunblock. yeah so i use uh blackboard chalk which is calcium carbonate you just okay. get crayola blackboard chalk and you, you grind it up in a coffee grinder to a really really fine powder and then you get your spray bottle and you fill it up to just where the neck starts tapering with the water 
put a couple of drops of, of dishwashing liquid in there, dump your chalk in there and shake it up really good. And then you could spray it on the plants and the calcium carbonate is one of the most reflective surfaces known to man. Okay. And once it dries, it stays on those leaves uh, for years until the leaves fall off and it's non-toxic, it's just calcium. It won't kill the soil. So is that specifically for like leaves, that. or can you make a paint? You can spray it. Well, like you could do uh, you could do trunk green paint on the uh, the avocados. Um, you could always tint it too with a green or a brown to make it more natural looking if you want. Um, or you just use regular white trunk paint for like orange trees or whatever, and uh, you could spray the leaves. It might kind of look funny. Yeah. You know, for 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 a little bit. But, as long as it uh, lives. Yeah, it lives. And uh, like I said, you know, you can cover those with the sweet potatoes. I'd recommend planting sweet potatoes all over the yard you know it'll, it'll <laughs> help break up the soil and you can harvest at the end of the year and move them around and they do look good you know they get the uh the flowers and, and sometimes the leaves are purplish green so uh as far as uh understory plants um so you want to grow some figs i think i've got that covered right? star fruits and <laughs> yeah. yeah mangoes like i said mangoes will turn into a uh, a canopy tree eventually, but it's, it's probably going to take uh, 15 to 20 years to get to that point. Um, what about, uh, well, we got the vines, we got the passion fruits. Are you going to grow any other vines like grapes or anything like that? Because grapes do really good Maybe. here. <laughs> yeah. I'm not crazy about grapes. Yeah. I yeah, can always give it away. Yeah. Yeah. I have. And another uh, thing I do is I breed reptiles, but I also breed the insects that the reptiles eat. And, you know, the whatever my wife and I don't eat or people don't want, it goes right to those insects. They eat yeah. it and then it goes right to the reptiles. Yeah, so natural, organic for the reptiles. Cycle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, the potato leaves, I'm sure they could eat it even though it's a nightshade. It's, it's not going to kill the bugs. They'll process it. Yep. So it's, it's a lot of free food for your insects. That'd be great. Um, what about uh, ground cover type plants? When we first moved in, I was thinking of uh, it was it's a succulent, and it's called a uh, dwarf carpet of stars. Yes, it just turns out to be hard to to come by yeah. in Phoenix for some yeah. reason. The line a lot of yeah. Uh, this one is uh, Ruscia nana yeah. specifically. Okay. All right, and I guess in California, Southern California, and and Las Vegas, they're promoting it like crazy. Yeah, that's a, a lawn because, replacement. Yeah, I saw where yeah. a guy had a lawn made out of it and uh -huh. he drove his T100 up on it and drove it off and yeah. didn't do anything to it. But, you know, I, with the wood chips being down, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't planning on putting that in a place with the wood chips, maybe just a place that had this natural soil here. Yeah. Um, but other than that, no, no ground covers that I've been thinking of. Yeah, they do. So they do sell the ruchia in uh, plugs. Yeah. And uh, they say it's super easy to grow. It's really not. It's that not easy. Okay. No, no. I've, I've, I've bought plugs before. I think I spent 50 bucks on a flat of uh, 100 and they just didn't do too good. Okay. <laughs> I'll be 100% honest with you. Um, you'd, you'd probably have to grow it in uh, some sort of flat, uh, like a cactus soil or something, and, okay. and keep multiplying it, multiplying it. It's keep spreading that soil out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But it takes in, a while. In our natural soil. Yeah, they, they, they'll go. No, it, they tout it as uh, you know super easy, and, and if it really was, it probably would have taken a lot more than it has. So you know you could try it. Makes sense. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could try it, but it, it's. It's not as easy as you know <laughs> as I thought it was. Um, I thought it was. Well, of course, I mean you got to look at the people doing the YouTube video on how yeah. easy it is to grow. They're also selling it. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, good. That's a great marketing ploy. Yeah. So, uh, what about roots? Yeah, you know, like root vegetables. So, I mean, I I actually was planning on like once some of the trees started taking off and making some shade, you know. Um, I study companion planting, so mm -hmm. I think was it garlic is supposed to go good with apple trees and you know, start doing some stuff like that. Yeah. Um, probably put some artichokes interspersed in there. Um, but other than that, no, I haven't put yeah. and mo much more thought into it. Yeah. So yeah, when you're when you're planting ground cover or uh, root type plants. If you're planting them really close to a tree, the only thing that may screw you up with is pruning and picking. 
Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, if you do that, you got to leave a little bit of room so you can get in there because after about two years, you're going to be pruning. If you grow any sort of stone fruit or apple or something like that, you're going to be pruning them like crazy. Yeah. So you do need to be able to get in there and maneuver around. Um, and then also for the picking aspect. So, so uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you plan on doing on this side of the yard here? This side of the yard, I've ran it past the sensitive tropicals or subtropicals in here. Yeah. Like low quads or avocados. So yeah. That, so, that's what I was looking for. Yeah. yeah. So are you gonna plant any sort of happy trees over here? I wasn't planning on it, but you know you just I could see how the first summer we goes. I'm taking on a moringa here and yeah. have it come up and yeah. give it shade. Yeah. That'd probably be great. Why not? Moringas have a tendency to, once they get the, the pods on them, they, the branches have a tendency to weep. So you could this way the neighbor's house and have it shade most of this area. You know, and it'll, they usually grow, even from seed, they'll grow in about a year to about 15 feet tall. Right. And then the second year, they can be 30, 40 feet tall. Um, Usually with moringa, you gotta top them. Otherwise, yeah. they just roll. Like they'll keep going straight. Stick up. straight up, yeah. So yeah, you top it, and it'll it'll usually put out two runners going up, and get more bushy at that point. So, what would your recommendation, like, as far as placement of the moringa in this area? I find you put it along the wall or somewhere over here. Okay. Um, and that could be a sacrificial tree. So also. then as this sun that's behind us is beaten down, all the shade's gonna be getting projected that way. Exactly. How yeah. high before you would top it? Um, I usually top it probably at about right there. So okay. is that like eight feet? About seven, eight feet. Yeah, yeah. somewhere around there. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's a sacrificial tree, so you can always chop that down too, you know? Yeah. Um, the, it's. In certain areas where it's humid, they are invasive because they put out so many seeds. Um, you just got to stay up on collecting the seeds. Okay. You, you probably wouldn't have an issue here. And even if you did, um, when they sprout, they're so weak, you could just step on them and yeah. kill them. So it's, it's not a big deal with that. And, uh, you know, you could always grow them and give them away or stuff like that. You could feed the leaves to your, your bugs, your, yeah. your reptiles. I know they're real popular. Yeah, yeah. My bearded dragons, they, they love the little leaves. Or okay. <laughs> you know, little baby bearded dragons, it's it's the perfect bite size, a little, yeah. you know, piece for them. So, so you want to grow, you were thinking of growing a loquat here and an avocado, huh? Yes. So you're going to put loquat right in this corner? Somewhere in this area. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if I'll actually put it in the corner here. Yeah. I wanted it further out. Okay. I can always move the water to it. Yeah. Yeah, and then you, you were thinking of doing an avocado over here? Yes. So what type of avocado were you thinking? At first, like, with watching YouTube videos, like, I, the specific cultivar was Carmen that I would be looking for, but yeah, what I've learned is that in our area, you really want to go with a seedling. Yeah. Like, grafted avocados just don't live here. Yeah. So. Yeah, so there's a... There's three different types of avocados mainly. It's uh, West Indies, which mm -hmm. grow in like the Caribbean, and then we right. got the Guatemalan and the Mexican. They say the Mexican is more hardy here. Yeah. Um, I've grown all three, and I haven't noticed really any difference between one or the other. They okay. seem to all grow great here. Uh, summer, winter, it doesn't matter. So um, are you gonna do just one seedling, or are you gonna grow it yourself, or? At this point, I don't know. I don't know. I, oh, I know there's. Well, I know you. You have some seedlings, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I, I don't know how big they are. Um, I think Alan has some seedlings at Queen Creek Tropicals that are maybe this big. So yeah. Um, you know, I'm not afraid to spend money. Yeah. To cut back on time. Yeah. So I mean, if I had to start from this and then wait a year to get to here when I can already buy it for. 60 some odd bucks or yeah, whatever, I'm gonna yeah. spend 60 bucks. So what I did uh, with my avocados, a lot of them that are gonna be out in more or less full sun <laughs> um, or close to it, I planted a bunch of them together, okay? Right? So I, I planted one in the middle and then did a ring. So there's probably about seven or eight planted in there. And what that does is 
they put out more leaves, which will shade the trunk. Because if you just plant one, you're going to wind up with a skinny branch and a bunch of little leaves at the top, and, and the trunk's just going to be prone to sunburning. Right. And uh, the leaves are going to get all crispy. And that's leaves. exactly what I've heard about the grafted is that yeah. if, if you have it in the ground, mm -hmm. you're probably about this high before you get any leaves. Yeah. And all that trunk is just going to get blasted yeah. and killed. Yeah. And even with the trunk paint, um, It'll save it, but it's still going to cook. You're going to wind up with scorching, especially on the south side. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I planted a bunch of them together, and what I did was I grew a, I grew them up to a certain height, and then I wrapped the trunks together, all tightly okay. in a bundle with some paracord. And that, that's a, a bonsai technique. Right. It's it's called inoculation or inosculation in nature. So if you have two trees grown together, eventually they're going to fuse together. Two separate trees it's going to look like one so i inosculated a bunch of them together and since the branches were bent they actually grew more coming out so it's, it's a bunch of trunks going into one and then more coming up out of the side so it, it creates more of a bushy shorter plant so i got one of those it's uh, a whole bunch of different varieties um it's in a grow bag so you just plop it in the ground um there's a haas in there um a Florida avocado. I think there's a a yellow or a uh, a red long neck, um, and a couple others. I can give you a rundown on it, but okay. you know it's it's probably about in the pot, about three and a half feet tall already, and it's multi branched and and ready to go. So when it yeah. comes to the fruiting varieties, mm -hmm. I do want to keep them to a size where I can reach the fruit or yeah exactly. if i have to get a little you know picker I and mean, just yeah. just a few feet up there yeah not so. reaching 30 feet mm -hmm. yeah so I, I don't know uh how true it is but they say you need a lot of cross pollination so i planted a bunch of these avocados together so if there is any issue with cross pollination you got like six or seven varieties growing there all is one tree and uh you know you got multiple root systems sharing nutrients from one to the other too so that's another plus so if you're interested in something like that yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah um and it's uh it's been growing now for about a year and a half it spent uh the end of last winter all summer last summer and all winter this winter outside okay and no protection in the winter got a little frost damage on the top on the new leaves but the old leaves perfectly fine so and that's one of those fruits I don't really care about the mm -hmm. variety because I've had of course Haas that we get in the stores but then I've had some you get the Asian markets that are this big or yeah Fuertes and they all taste the same I agree yeah, yeah. some of them are a little more oily some are a little yeah. more dry but yeah I mean avocados and avocados and avocado, avocado. Yeah. yeah you know with the with seed grown, some of them though, you, you could wind up with a giant seed and almost no flesh. Okay. But, you know, if you got a bunch of different varieties grown right. together, you, you might luck out on yeah, one of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you could come up with the next latest and greatest avocado. Yeah. <laughs> so, what else do you plan on planting here? Uh, don't know. That's also why you're here. Yeah. Um, of the, the list of trees that I had, I mean, they, they, everyone is telling me to do my more sensitive stuff over here. Mm -hmm. But, um, like I said, everyone says the, the star fruit can take full sun. Once you get the mango to the right size, they can take full mm -hmm. sun. Um, so off the top of my head, just at this point in time, the loquat and the avocado. Yeah. But, you know, I don't know. You said you've grown jackfruit. I have. Now yeah. I, I actually love the fruit on jackfruit. Oh, jack I don't know great. how yeah. well a tree would do in the ground here. <laughs> it's pretty much like any other tropical. It's going to need protection the first couple of years from sun, cold, extra watering. Mm -hmm. um, but once it's established, they grow. They grow fine here. Okay. You know, you, you really need to uh, build up the size and, and get some bark on it and, and some good foliage, and uh, they do grow good. Um, they are a little sensitive to frost, so yeah. when you do get frost, I mean, you really need to cover it. Uh, put a heat lamp or something right. underneath just to give it some extra warmth. You make your growth tip die back, but for the most part, it'll it'll pull through. Well, that's another thing is I was thinking of putting the mango on this side because I know even even though those can take the heat, the frost that we get here will destroy a mango. 
and I was thinking if you they're actually not as frost sensitive a bunch of trees together that that you need to do special care on you could maybe make oh yeah there's yeah, one area easier where, where you could do that yeah yeah my yard uh i got two uh two mangoes growing okay and i had zero frost damage i didn't protect them at all this huh. winter so and they, they've been in the ground now three years i've never got frost damage so that area does get frost i, I see some frost on the ground because it's in the front yard covered yeah. surrounded by rocks but uh yeah, we got it here yeah i mean it was this year i was shocked it was maybe And like I said, I have a laser thermometer and it was, the ambient temperature was 32, but I came out and I hit the ground and there were spots that were 27, yeah. 24, and you could, the, the wood chips were all covered in frost. Yeah. 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 I think, uh, I think mango grown, I think you'd be okay with the frost. It's like you said, all these sensitive plants here, this is probably a good spot because you could very easily cover it. Um, you could put some sort of heater to blow on them. Right. Um, yeah, they're all grouped together. I've got an electrical outlet right there if I need a heater blowing in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't take much either. Just one or two degrees and you're pretty good. Hey guys, so it's been a couple of weeks since I've actually been out to George's house and filmed the first half of this video. I had to go back out and get some uh, extra footage and stuff. Wound up uh, running over my GoPro with the Jeep by accident and uh, luckily there was no damage to it, just a lens and uh, suction cup mount. But uh, I hope you liked the video so far. So going back editing the video, I realized there's a lot of questions I left unanswered and just to let you guys know, George and I talked before we filmed, uh, in between filming different scenes and also we talked a lot after and I've been back to his house and I brought him some seeds, some plants and stuff like that from the plant. Um, and he's actually doing pretty good with that. So he's pretty happy, but basically uh, his his goal is to start a permaculture style food forest, all right? And he's out in the foothills of the Superstition Mountains. So it gets a little colder there in the, uh, the winter. Um, there's a little less uh, heat island effect. So it doesn't get as hot in the summer and they get cooler nights than we do down here in the city areas. So, Basically, what he wants to do, like I said, is a permaculturalist style food forest. Now, you know, we're kind of limited here in Arizona to rainfall. So, you know, you're you're not going to have a 100% uh, input free food forest here. Um, you are going to have to add water. You're going to have to prepare the soil. Um, you know, wood chips are a must here. He's getting wood chip drops like crazy. Um, but, you know, we, we went over it, you know, you need a, a canopy to block the sun, block the wind, keep the evaporation down from what little rainfall we have. And, uh, you know, then he, he's gonna have to do some understory trees and then uh, some uh, bushes, some vines, ground cover, and then root crops. So that's what we're trying to get together and uh, accomplish for him. You know, I, uh, I'm not charging him for this. Uh, I met him, uh, he came over and bought some plants. We got to talking and, you know, uh, he asked if I'd come out and do a consultation and people charge a lot of money for that. And I said, listen, I'm not gonna charge you anything. Let me make a video out of it so we could share your experience and, and help other people out. And he was cool with that. So this is uh, free of charge. You know, I'm not making money off of this. I don't make money off the YouTube channel. So this is all for you guys. You know, I like sharing my knowledge and you know, I like to see you guys improve. I like the questions. I like talking to you guys online. So, you know, it's, it's enjoyable for me. I mean, it, it takes a lot of time, but it is something really, really fun. I really do enjoy it. You know, maybe in a couple of years down the road, I might not enjoy it so much because it does take up a lot of my free time, but it is fun. So um, if you guys have any more questions about, uh, you know, start a food forest in the valley, how to go about it or whatever, you know, hit me up in the comments. Uh, I can give you my phone number, we get text. I'm like, you know, maybe I can come out, maybe you guys can come over here. You know, I do uh, master gardening classes in my backyard for, for customers, you know, people want to grow something and they see my backyard and they, they didn't think it was possible. And I tell them how easy it is. And, you know, I, I give them a copy of my plant grow guide, which I am going to post down in the comments, a link to it. It's free to download. It's uh, all how to grow plants 
in your backyard or front yard or, or wherever here in the valley. Um, it particularly pertains just the, the Phoenix metro area or Tucson or Yuma, you know, basically the lower desert areas of uh, Arizona, it'd probably work in Texas, New Mexico, Nevada, Southern California, you know, we're all pretty much the same in this area, desert Southwest. Um, so yeah, that's basically it guys. Uh, I'm gonna do some updates. You know, I'm gonna be going back out to George's house periodically. Uh, he might join me in some videos too in the future. You know, we're thinking of visiting the Tucson Swales. Um, he's really interested in that. We may do some uh, gorilla gardening in certain places. You guys might be interested in that. Uh, maybe seed bombing, maybe uh, put some cuttings in strategic locations to help the, uh, the environment out and uh, help cool down our, uh, our soil here and, and uh, help nature along a little bit. So if you like this video, guys, please, uh, sorry about that. Please uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, comment. I love hearing from you guys. I know I said it before, but one of the highlights of my day is, is reading your, your comments and, and chatting with you. So uh, until the next video, guys, keep growing.